question is, is do you mean what you just sang? Meredith started out the song by saying, we want to hear the power of your word. And so God is very faithful and he is here and his word is before us. And so there were many things said in that song about come Holy Spirit, I want to be undone, I want to hear the power of your word. So God's done his part in that. The question now is, will you do yours by laying down your preference and setting aside your feelings and offering up to the Lord your mind and heart and saying, God, I don't want to just hear your word. that the storms obey. Not just some man quoting from a book. God, we want to hear the voice that the storms obey. That's the God we want to hear from. So I wanted to just take a moment and have that conversation with God. And let him know whether you're here to listen and learn and lean in and to let his word bear its weight on your life. want you here. We want you to take over this place, but we want you to take over this place right here. This is where we offer our heart and mind to you right now, Lord, and ask you to do with it as you desire. You have had a plan for this night since eternity past, and it is upon us, and here we are. We are gathered in your house, in your presence, with your word in our hand. So come, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Not just the prayer of the pastor, but the cry of our hearts tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. I hope that that's your prayer. All right, well, I want to... Uh, tell you that I am super excited to share God's word with you for sure, and it's, uh, as, as my brother Mike would say, it's hammer time, and, and it's, it's not always easy to receive. Um, <laughs> some parts of the Bible are lighter than others. This Sermon on the Mount ain't Christianity light, okay? And so there's no sign of Jesus taking his foot off the gas pedal. But before we get into that hammer time, I just want to lighten the, the room a little bit and share a, just a cute story that has absolutely nothing to do with this. And it was my little girl, Jameson, was telling us the other day that she wanted it to snow and we, something came up in the, we were in the car, I guess it was. Were, were we in the car or were we in the living room? I think we were in the car. And, she, and, and, and we talked about how cool it would be if it snowed here. And, and so she said, well, let's just ask God to make it snow. And so, of course, like most of us, we get into conservative mode. And, you know, Joshua asked God to make the sun stand still. How many people think that they could kind of pull that one off? Probably not. But, but Joshua asked God to do it. And, and guess what? He did it, right? So pray audacious prayers. So my little girl wants to pray that it's going to snow. Well, it's Florida, and it doesn't snow here. So, of course, we kick into conservative mode, and my wife says, well, honey, God really likes to pull off miracles that bring him glory. And so I'm not really quite sure if 
it's snowing in Florida is going to bring him much glory. And she goes, well, yeah, I know that. So I was going to ask for wisdom and for it to snow. I just thought that was kind of cute. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. All right, let's, turn, let's grab our Bible and open it to Matthew uh, chapter 5. And we're going to read actually 10 verses. 27 through 37 is going to be our text for this evening's uh, time in God's Word. And as you're turning there, I just want to tell you, like, as I was studying this, you know, sometimes the, the text that you're reading, it kind of forces you to think about some things, you know. And so as I was reading through the Sermon on the Mount these last couple of months, actually, uh, oftentimes I was thinking, okay, here's these rules, and, and, and Jesus is saying, okay, we got this command, and we got that command, and we start thinking about these commands, and I start thinking inevitably of the times that I failed to keep the commands, right? Am I alone? Don't leave me up there, right? All of us. So, so all of us fail in many ways. As a matter of fact, the Bible even says that. You know, God says, hey, we all fail in many ways. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all, we all fail. So we have all these, these yeah buts, you know. So we got God's law and his commands and his precepts and all that stuff. And this is what he wants us to do. And this is what he doesn't want us to do. And we got all these buts, you know. Buts after buts after buts. You know, um, I know it's under the table. But, but, but I got bills to, to, to pay. You know, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. But you know what? It's under the table. But I got to pay some bills. I know it's dirty, but, you know, I only watch it. I don't touch. I know the speed limit, but I got to get to church on time. I know my wife doesn't like when I talk to Sally much at work because it makes her uncomfortable. But we're just friends. And I know it's wrong to divorce, but I deserve to be happy. But you don't know what he did. And, but you don't know my struggle. But the law allows. And, you know, the scriptures are clear that there's things that are legal, but they're not always beneficial. But the law, but, 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 here's the law, and then there's the buts. See, that's the problem. The problem is, is that we have God's laws. Right? You got them in your hand. The Bible's full of them. God makes these laws. This is the way I want things to work. I'm God. I created everything. I'm the boss of all things. And this is the law. This is the way I want y'all to live. Right? <clears throat> problem is you and me I know this is the law but <laughs> right but we start rationalizing we stop we start making excuses for the reasons why we don't keep the laws don't we everybody should be raising their hand right now right of course I do it you do it we all do it everybody does it so we have laws, and we all say, but this and but that. And then as you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus comes along, and he says, you've heard it said, the law, but I say. See, there's your buts, and then there's Jesus' buts. And so the title of tonight's message is, Who's Got the Bigger Butt? And I don't mean who's got the bigger butt like the 80s song, the rap, okay? I get that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about your hind quarter. I'm talking about whose butt holds more weight, right? And that doesn't mean physically. It means important. Whose butt should you listen to? Your butt? I know the law, but. Or Jesus, hey, you know what the law is, but. Whose butt carries more weight? Who's got the bigger butt? And so we want to talk about this uh, butt problem. We all have a butt problem. We're going to talk about the AVD. That doesn't mean the audio video department of Revolution Church. It means adultery, vows, and divorce. Okay? And I want to talk about that. Now, last week, we spent the entire week talking about um, adultery. But as I started to read this again, I went on to the next section, I realized that these three sections, adultery, vows, and divorce, they go hand in hand. 
See, there was none of these divisions when Jesus spoke it up there on, on the mountainside. He got up on the mountain. His disciples were sitting there. He started talking. And he didn't stop and go, okay, that's my section on adultery. Here's my next section. Take a break, hit the bathroom, and come back, and we're going to talk about divorce. He didn't do that. He got up on the mountain. He started talking. And these three things really have, they're all intertwined. You can't separate them. They're all one thing. So let's just go ahead and let's do this. It's, it's, a, it's a long section of scripture, but I want to read it, and it's God's word, so it should have value to you, and so reading it shouldn't be a problem in any way. And so we're going to read this, okay? So I'm going to read Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 27. I read out of the New Living Translation. You don't have to. You can read out of whatever translation you want, but here we go. You ready? All right, here it is. You have heard the commandment that says you must... Not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. It's kind of important, right? He's talking about hell and heaven. here, Like, this is a big deal, right? Pay attention. And if your hand, even your strong hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, I don't want to uh, review that too much because we'll be here all night, but we do have access on our website and our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. If you weren't here last week, you want to go to those places and you want to watch that so you can know what Jesus was teaching you about adultery. That's critical to know what he's talking about, especially a text that talks about gouging out eyeballs and lopping off hands, right? So there's some people in the church here tonight that I see that are first time. I don't even know if you've ever read the Bible before, and you walk into a church and this Savior, King, and God is saying, gouge out your eyeball. That's weird. So you need clarity on that. Don't just walk out of here going, yeah, Christians are weird. They're cannibals. I'm out of here. Don't do that. Go back and watch the sermon, please. All right, let's just read on. So now he's teaching about something else, but same sermon. He's still talking. He's got his disciples right there. He says, you've heard the law that says, he's, he's quoting the Old Testament law again. He says, you've heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Okay, let's move on. You've also heard that our ancestors were told, here he goes, he's going to quote another law, you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Yeah, what king is that? Him. Capitalized. Do not even say, by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple, yes, I will, or no, I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Okay. So, I just want to give you a heads up. Several, if not everything I talk to you about tonight, is going to sting. And I don't mean a dentist lying sting who says this is going to pinch a little and then it kills. I'm telling you right now, this is going to hurt. I know where you live. I know where I live. I know the 49 years that I've been brought up in this world. And I know that everything in this section of scripture and everything that I'm going to share with you goes against the grain of probably everything you have ever practiced under the name of Christ. So I would just tell you this. Bear with me. Velcro your butt. We're talking about butts, right? So just Velcro your butt to your seat. Take it all in. And don't make a decision on the spot. Go home. Open your Bible. Read it. Pray. Ask the Lord to tell you, is this guy for real? Is what he's saying correct? Or if, if it's garbage, you won't offend me. Toss whatever I say and throw it in the trash where it would belong if it's garbage. Would you do that? 
You guys all going to do that? Awesome. All right. I would just want to start out by saying that the number one problem in the church of Jesus Christ, the thing that kills our effectiveness in reaching the world with the gospel, is this lack of our will for, to, to engage our will to strive for the holiness that God requires of us. Okay? Jesus said in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Be perfect, therefore, even as my Father in heaven is perfect. That is a holiness of a whole new level. This is not what your parents wanted of you. This is not what your teacher wanted of you. This is not what the pastor or the police officer wants of you. This is what Jesus, like he didn't suggest it. He didn't offer it up as a decent option. What did he say? Be perfect, therefore. Like it's a command. Like Jesus Christ, the one you have on your shirt, the one who you have on your cross, the one who you have in your heart, the one who you have on your bumper sticker, the one you say is your Lord, which means what? You obey him. He said, be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. That's a high level of set apart. That's a high level of different. That is a high level of being like someone named Jesus. Like you're supposed to be like God in the way you think, in the way you talk, in the way you act, in all of that stuff. Be as your heavenly father is. That's a high level of holiness. And the problem is when Jesus says, be perfect even as God is perfect, the problem is that people see our imperfect so often and so much that they're not drawn to Jesus. They're pushed away from Jesus. Because the perfect that they see is so imperfect, they cannot see Jesus. The chasm between it is written and what is done is so wide, they can't even find him in this mess. And that's super, super important. Because the scripture says that it is by his mighty power at work in you where he can do immeasurably more than we could ask or think. The advancement of Jesus Christ's kingdom is, is most often done through you. Can he show up in a vision? Yes, he can. Can he show up in a dream? Yes, he can. Can he show up and you're in nature and you're out there by yourself and you look at his creation and you just sense him calling you to the cross? Yes, he can. But most people worldwide come to Jesus through the testimony and the witness of another one of his followers. That's plan A for Jesus building his kingdom is through you. And so when Jesus says, be like God, and we're so not, we won't engage our will to do exactly what it says. People walk into a church, they hear the preacher, like tonight, they're gonna, you're in here, first time, you don't know us from a hole in the wall, and you're going to hear me say some things. And the worst thing that we could do as a people is to display something that is so not this. What, we, what is the thing that people hate about Christians? They don't practice what they preach. They don't practice what they preach. And that's the problem. God says, strive for a holiness that is way up here. And we're just so flipping about it. We're better than we were. I'm better than him. She's better than she is. I haven't killed anyone yet. So I'm better. You know, listen, no, no, no. A holiness that is high. Because he's working through you. Not only are you valuable because you're made in his image and you have value and worth, innate, in you, ingrained already because you're made in his image, but you're super valuable because your witness is super, super important. It is, it is the witness of his people that will drive other people to him. And it is the witness of his people that unfortunately will drive them away from him. And since God, the scriptures say that God is making his plea 
through us. You know, the ones who have bowed the knee to Jesus as Lord. He's making his plea through us, the ones who are indwelled by his Holy Spirit. And since God, who is holy is making his plea through you, then we ought to take heed to what Jesus is saying here. We should take heed to his butt over your butts. Don't you agree? And it's time, man. It's time for the church to wake up to this reality. The kingdom of God that we all pray for and long for to come, it is not going to come until we pursue this type of holiness. Until we allow God to work in us that are already part of it so that he can use us to spread his kingdom to others. Always. So, adultery, vows, and divorce. Like, these three, think about this. Jesus goes up on the mountain. He could have talked, I mean, he could have talked about anything. So many different things, right? So what is he, I don't even know if most of these guys were married. So why, why is he teaching these crusty old fishermen about marriage? Well, maybe some of them are married, or maybe there's something bigger going on here, right? Maybe he's trying to get people's hearts to have some sort of level of fidelity so they could be loyal to him, so he could use them for his purposes, and so he uses marriage. These three topics of adultery and vows and divorce are so commonly shredded by Christians, and that's why Jesus, I, I, I believe that's why he chose these three topics to discuss amongst countless topics that he could have. And you think about people saying, well, you know, the Bible is ancient history, and it was good for before, and, you know, talk about timeless truths. Think about just these three subjects. Are they still not at the the front burner of our life? Divorce, rampant, 50%. Adultery, rampant all over our country, all over the world. And you'll see the vow thing. I'll talk to you about that. But these things are 2,000 years later. 2,000 years later, after Jesus comes down off the mountain talking about these things, these three things are still absolutely needed right here, right now. So look at this first subject here, adultery. We're talking about people's butts, right? But I'm just looking. You know. And, and, and because I'm just looking, you know, but I'm not hurting anyone because I'm just looking. And, but I'm a man. And, but I'm not dead yet. And, but I'm not actually sleeping with... But it's only lunch. But we only talk. But it's only Facebook. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, there's God's law, and then there's our butts, and then there's Jesus' butts. And which one needs to be paramount in our life? See, that's the problem. We make excuses, Jesus makes clarity. And I think that in my experience, I don't know about you, (coughs) <coughs> but I think what our butts are, are is this. We tend to hang our toes over the sin cliff. You know, don't sleep with someone. I'm married. I'm not supposed to sleep with anybody else. The only one I share my bed with is Meredith, right? So if I'm going to cheat on her, if I'm going to sleep with somebody else, let's just say it's right there. There's the cliff. I don't want to fall off that cliff. Like, I don't want to cheat on my wife. But, but I can get my toes over here a little bit, and I want to just, let's just see how close I can get, right, without actually sinning. That's what, that's what these butts are. But, I'm, but I haven't slept with her yet, but I'm just looking, but I'm just thinking about it, so that doesn't hurt anybody, does it? See, nobody ever, like I said last week, nobody ever is like, totally in love with their wife, not ever thinking about another woman, never even contemplating it, and slips and falls, and whoa, I'm in bed with this chick. That never happened. It started up here on top of the cliff, 
and we were getting our toes close to it because we started thinking about it, we started fantasizing about it, we started having lunch with her, we started talking to her on Facebook, it's just a friendly thing, we've been buddies before we were married to you, before I was married to you, she was my friend. Danger, danger, did you ever see that? Danger, Will Robinson, danger! Something should go off in your mind. And that's the problem. We tend to hang our, how close can I get before I actually commit the sin? See, our butts is, well, I haven't slept with him yet. But Jesus' butt is, don't even think about sleeping with him. Don't, don't, even, don't even go have lunch with him. Don't, don't even start taking phone calls from him. Don't give him your email address. Don't, don't friend request the old girlfriend from high school. Don't do that. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't changing the law ever. He's clarifying it. See, we, we, this is why Jesus came and did this on the Sermon on the Mount. It's not that the law had to change. The law is still in existence. Do not commit adultery, right? Do you guys understand that the law still exists? Right? Anyone in here think it's okay to commit adultery? We have counseling after church tonight if you think so. Okay? He never said that this is no longer. What he's saying is he's clarifying. See, we take food and we overeat. We take wine and we overdrink. And so God says don't commit adultery. And so what we do is, okay, I can't sleep with another woman. That's, that's the rule right there. And, God, and Jesus, God, says, no, 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 no. When I said that, what I meant was, don't even let it start happening here. That's not the, that's not, that's not the sin. This was the sin. Way before you got there, you got there. He's just raising the bar and explaining with clarity what the law really is. The law that said do not commit adultery was not the physical act in the bed, Jesus makes it quite clear, if it starts happening here first, you've already committed the adultery. That was the law. There were people keeping the law, that law, and they were incorrect. That's why Jesus is talking. Like I said last week, if they were doing it just right, he would have gone up on the mountain and said, all right, gather up, disciples, come here, come here. See those Pharisees over there? Do what they do. Amen. But he didn't do that, did he? He's clarifying some stuff to the people who keep it perfectly. So obviously they weren't getting it. And that's what he's trying to do here. See, remember, we're looking for, he's looking for holiness. He said, therefore, be holy even as I, the Lord, am holy. Be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Holiness that Jesus is talking about is holistic. It's mind, it's heart, it's soul, it's flesh, it's emotional, it's mental, it's physical, it's relational, it's all of these things. I want you to be set apart for me. I want you to be different than everybody else, and I want you to not copy another person, but I want you to copy me, my son. Here he is. He's perfect. Be like him. That's what holy is. All of you, not just your actions, but the motivation behind it, the thought, the mental, the emotional part of it, all of it. And so it's the same with God. That's really, I think, what Jesus is doing here. He's trying to build loyal hearts in his people. Hey, listen, if you won't cheat on your wife, or you won't cheat on your husband, maybe you won't cheat on me. And his people are always cheating on him. You know this, right? You read the Bible, that's all they did, all the time. He delivers them out of bondage, gives them bread from heaven and, and quail coming in over the desert, and they have water from a rock, and, and then he opens up the Red Sea. Like, you'd think they'd be loyal to this guy. And then they go build a golden calf and go worship. Like, this is, we're not, we're, we're unfaithful to God. And God's trying to build faithfulness in the hearts of his people. Nobody ever falls into bed with a woman or a man. Nobody is rocking the Christian faith at church all the time, reading the word day and night, studying it, meditating on it day and night, serving the Lord, giving to the Lord's kingdom, doing all this stuff, praying like crazy, and all of a sudden, the next day, you know what? I'm a Buddhist. And they find themselves in a Buddhist temple, just worshiping, I don't know, Vishnu or whatever the world they do. Nobody ever does that. You know how it happens? See, that's not, that's not where the sin happens. You know where the sin happens? 
The sin happens when you marry someone who's of a different faith and they start sucking you into that. The, that, that, that sin happens when you start hanging around with certain people that have that belief system and they start talking to you about it all day and you don't go like this. And they suck you into that. The problem is, is when you start watching, you know, I'm, hey, I'm a little curious, you know. Maybe I'll watch, you know, this show about, you know, Deepak Chopra and I'll entertain the, you know, this new age stuff where, you know, I don't know. Everybody's right. Everyone is God. You're God. Hey, Roger, you're God. That's cool. Hey, Robert, you're God. We can all be God. Hey, table, chair. Hey, hey, you're God. Let's just be God. We start entertaining this foolishness, right? And we start thinking, well, maybe I'll just read this book. This one looks a little curious. Everybody's been reading this thing. It sounds good. They all said it's nice. So let's just check that out. Listen, the seeds of, of evil get planted in your head, and all of a sudden, that's when you find yourself in the Buddhist temple because you entertained the demons. You can't mess with fire and not expect to get burned. That's the problem. That's the problem. See, the problem is that we lower the sin bar so low as to say, here's the bed. And as long as I don't get in this bed with another woman, I'm good. And because we've lowered that bar so low, it gives us, as sinful, broken people, the permission slip to let our heart and mind go places that they don't belong. That's the problem. Because we haven't slept, listen, I ain't killed nobody yet. That guy, he's doing all this stuff here, but I ain't killed anybody yet, so I'm good. That's lowering the bar so low, that's not the whole, think about that. Think about the holiness of God. The perfection of Almighty God and his desire for you to be like that and compare that to the bar you set for your adultery. Is it even close? That's the problem. That's a massive problem. All right. Enough about that. That was last week's sermon. So let's move on. We just want to go in order here in the scriptures, perfectly ordered. Don't need to fix it in any way. Let's talk about divorce right there, right? 50% divorce rate? Do you know what's really, really crazy? Think about this. Jesus said, be perfect even as my Father in heaven is perfect. So, so Jesus goes to the cross and he dies, and then he goes into the tomb, and he raises himself from the dead. What? Like, who can pull that one off? And then the crazy, even crazier, he says that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. So when you think about the holiness that God is talking about, and that same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. You think you might be a little bit different than other people? Maybe, just maybe. So when he's talking about holiness, this should be a dramatic change. So shouldn't it break our heart that that 50% divorce rate is almost the exact same thing in the church as it is outside? Before I talk about this, I, can I just admit something before you? Meredith and I are epic failures at this. So I'm not preaching like we're awesome at this whole fidelity and no divorce thing, okay? You all know my story. I'm a train wreck. And hers is not much better. So we failed in this big time. So I'm not preaching from a place of success. I'm only preaching from a place of truth. So allow me the privilege to do that. And don't look at my failures in my past and say, well, he has no right to talk about it. Because the person who spoke most about marriage in the Bible was a man named Paul who was never married. And we take his word, okay? So allow me the privilege. 50% divorce rate, nearly the same in the church. And think about this, seriously. Think about... The, the holiness of God and what he's called you to be, set apart, totally different, living like Jesus, and that spirit that's inside of you and that church you want me to go to, and yet you and your wife can't work it out? If there's so little power in this Jesus that he can't even hold your marriage together, two people who got up onto the stage and 
promise their allegiance to the Lord and to each other forever. And, and what God has brought together, let no man separate. And a year later, you look on Facebook, and they're done, and she's dating another dude. What? Yeah, let me go to your church, because I need that power. Train wreck. Train wreck. Do you see what I'm talking about? This is the reason why we're not effective. Because they don't see Jesus. They see our imperfection so much that it drives them away from the Lord. What God brings together, let no man separate, Mark 10, 9 says. Now, I'm just going to read this little, it's a small section, just two verses of this whole thing about divorce again. He says, you've heard the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Okay, so we're in marriage. We go down the aisle, we say yes, and here we are in the marriage, but a year or two or five goes by, right? And all of a sudden, well, I know we got married, but... I deserve to be happy. Anyone ever hear that one before? I know we're married, but, but he changed. I know we're married, but she promised me that we would have children, and then she changed her mind. And, and, but, but, but she spends all my money, and, but, but he or she is looking at porn, but he won't work, but he works too much. So let me just say this, because I love you, like big time. I just want to tell you that if you're on that list, these are legit concerns, and I'm not making light of them, and I'm not saying you should just sweep it under the rug. I'm just saying don't use it as an excuse to bail. I would just strongly recommend you seek out great Christian counseling and work through that stuff. <clears throat> I heard it said recently that if your marriage has any value to Jesus, hell's coming after it. And so we're in a spiritual battle all the time. And so hell's coming after your marriage. Do you think El Diablo is pleased that Jay and Marty have been serving Jesus vocally for the last 35, 40 years. Do you think he's happy about that? Not one bit, right? He would love, he would love to break them up. Do you think that they're not aware of that? If they're not aware of it, they're morons. Very much aware of it. And if you don't think they've had to work on solving some problems. How many times did you, I mean, this is an open church. We're, o we're open. How many times did you just want to pack your crap and say, I'm done? Right? How many? How many, mama? Right? How many? We just want to, right? But if it's, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a value to Jesus, it should be a value to you. You fight for that thing. Right? You fight for it. So go find some counseling. And, 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 but, but, but he cheated on me. But she cheated on me. Okay, listen. Definitely counseling. You're not going to work through that without it. But I can also tell you this, and Meredith and I can tell you about it, and it would be in private because we don't want to divulge who it was and what happened, but such infidelity that your mind can't fathom was, 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 taking place in this marriage, beyond sick, beyond crazy. But when they determine in their heart to set their face like stone, determined to do his will, and seek counseling and seek the forgiveness that God brings us in the gospel, I can tell you that after that horrendous season of prostitution, homosexuality, physical abuse, and jail, Happily married. Happily, happily. You should be clapping right now, I'm telling you. Like, that is awesome, right? That is awesome. 
So you should seek some counseling for sure. But I want to say this. All of these buts, including infidelity, they're legit gripes, but by no means are they legit grounds for divorce. They're not. They're not. See, if you've, like most of us, if we've been invaded by the American dream and what shapes your entire existence is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, well, if that's the case and that's what's shaping your existence, then what you're going to do is you're going to treat your commitments like marriage as an avenue for personal happiness rather than what God intended for your marriage, which is personal holiness. That's what he created marriage for. It's for us to be holy, not necessarily happy. If we can achieve some happiness along the way, bravo, right? Awesome. But that's not the reason for the marriage. It's to create a holiness inside of us. Listen, we're talking about happiness versus holiness. You got to get this. I saw something here that just blew my mind. Never saw it before. I don't know if you have ever before, but I just saw it and I want to share with you and hopefully it blows your mind too and it does something to you. Let me ask you a question. What is adultery? Just yell it out. This ain't Catholic Church. Yell. What is it? Cheating. What? Physically? What is it? Emotionally? So it's, it's the act of sexual intercourse with someone other than your spouse. Would you agree? Is it the act of sexual intercourse with someone other than your spouse in your mind before you actually do it? Yes. Is it? Awesome. She's got it. I never realized this. I never realized this. My, my, I always thought that if I, if I commit adultery, it's because I did something with another woman. And Jesus raised the bar, not just physically if I sleep with her, but if I think about it. Maybe I pursue, like, rich conversations with Kay because I can't get it with my wife. Cheating, right? Is that cheating? That's cheating. Plus, he's massive and he'd kill me. So I know better, right? That's, that's adultery. That's what I always thought adultery was. The act of either physically or emotionally or mentally engaging with someone who's not of your, in your, as your spouse, right? That's, you're not supposed to do that. Isn't that what you thought? Paula didn't, but isn't that what you thought? That's what I thought. And it's not. It's partially that, but it's not just that. Look what the text says. He's listening. He says, if you... If you want to divorce your wife, like you give her a, a letter of divorce, and if you choose to divorce her, maybe it's because she spends all your money. Maybe it's because he's not good in bed. Maybe it's because she promised you children and now you can't have them. Maybe it's because he works too much. Maybe it's because she, he works too little. Maybe it's because he's looking at porn. Whatever it is, right? Maybe it is. So we file for divorce. And look what it says. It says, if you choose that avenue to divorce her, you cause your spouse to sin. Just marinate on that for a second. I really never even thought about that. So if, 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 my, if Meredith does something to disrupt my happiness, because I'm an American, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if she does something to disrupt or derail my chosen path of happiness and I divorce her, which in this country, rampant, we all do it. I actually cause her to commit adultery. What did she do? What did she do? Nothing. She spent too much money. She, she, she didn't work enough. She didn't give me the babies that I want. But what did she do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, right? A legit gripe maybe, but not a legit ground. And I decide I'm going to, my happiness is more important than holiness, so I'm going to leave her and I cause her to commit adultery. The adultery is the severing, severing of this marriage relationship of which you are in with God. 
That's adultery. It's the, so when, he, when the husband caused the separation, he caused, even though it was his choice, he caused his wife to sin. And was it not sin that put Jesus on the cross? It was sin that put Jesus on the cross. My happiness puts Jesus on the cross. She spends too much. Put Jesus on the cross. He works too much. He works too little. He doesn't make enough. I'm not happy. I deserve to be happy. So I'm out of here. Causes your spouse to sin. It puts Jesus on the cross. Because of our sin nature, we read this section of scripture and there's one beacon of hope. The beacon of hope is the unfaithfulness. You know, unless she's been unfaithful, it says, right? And we're like, oh, see? I got an out. I got an out. That's pathetic. She's been unfaithful, so I can divorce. He's been unfaithful, so I can divorce. Yeah, but Jesus said something about that. In Matthew 19, 8, Jesus said that that was not God's intention. But that Moses allowed divorce for unfaithfulness because of your hard hearts. That was not God's concession. That was Moses' concession because we were so but, 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 but. And I think Moses got sick and tired of hearing it. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts, but it was not what God had originally planned. There was no out because of your little gripes of, but, 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 I want to be happy. But he doesn't do this, but she doesn't do that. It's not all it was supposed to be. I wasn't prepared for this. It didn't work, it didn't work, it didn't work. I wish it had worked, but it didn't work. Marriage.com gave a top ten of reasons why people in this country get divorced. Infidelity. Probably can't see that. Infidelity. Money. Lack of communication, arguing, weight gain, unrealistic expectations, lack of intimacy, lack of equality, not prepared for marriage, or abuse. Anyone like those things? No one likes those things. But when... When God brought something together, he said, let no man separate it. And just because you have a legit gripe, that doesn't mean you have legit grounds. You can work on that thing, but you don't have to end that thing. What God brings together, let no man separate, is the clear mandate of Almighty God concerning marriage. And as a gospel-centered people who we here at Revolution Church claim to be, as indwelled believers of the Holy Spirit, as children of God to be Christ-like, we all realize that God forgave our infidelity to Him at the cross of Jesus Christ. And if we're to be holy even as God is holy, then we, as Christ followers, are to forgive others' infidelity toward us just like Jesus did. And, and this is a hard pill to swallow when someone's been cheated on because that is the number one killer of your pride. Nobody wants their spouse to be in bed with another person. And it's not, I, 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 listen, you can say what you want, but it's not about what she's doing, it's what you feel because Someone has your woman, or someone has your man, and that is mine. It's a knock to our pride. It's a hard one to swallow. But Jesus said, what God brings together, let no man separate. 
So instead of treating it flippantly and saying, well, she cheated on me, I got an out, why don't we realize that we're shooting for holiness rather than happiness and deal with the infidelity like Jesus did, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. He knew that in that moment you were cheating on him, and he hates that. It breaks his heart, but he put up with it and went to the cross because he was looking for something greater later. And if we would put that infidelity at the cross and forgive like Jesus did, we could have an awesome marriage later on if we don't bail. Isn't the goal of the gospel always reconciliation? Isn't the goal of the gospel always forgiveness? Isn't the goal of the gospel always restoration of relationship between God and his people and God's people together? Isn't it to bring black and white together, young and old together, ethnicities all together, one body under the banner of Jesus? That's what the gospel is supposed to do. Listen, there is power in a marriage when the gospel invades that unfaithful space. Big time power. That's when people see the resurrection power of Jesus when a marriage is dead and, he, and we allow God to breathe life into it and we could say, this is what happened, but then God and now this. That person can draw someone to church. Let no one split what God has joined. No ifs, no ands, and help me out here. And no buts, no buts, no buts, okay? What your flesh craves for in the moment, your will has to overpower that thing. And so if you're ready to dodge, if you're ready to bail, if you're ready to cheat, if you're ready to Facebook, I get it. Your will has to overpower that thing. And what we're doing in that moment is we're saying no to instant gratification in exchange for yes to eternal reward. I just want to say this openly. If you're struggling with infidelity in your marriage, I'm talking to the men in this church now, only the men, because I don't want anything to do with the ladies in this one. If you're struggling with infidelity in your marriage because you're looking at porn, I have a tool that will help you break that and salvage your marriage before your sin finds you out. And so if you'll seek me out, don't do it tonight where everyone sees you walk into my office and they're going to go, oh, there's the porn looker. Like, don't do it that night. Just find me during this week and next week. Call me. Come down and visit. I have a tool that will make the change in your life. If you're really serious about being faithful to the Lord and to your spouse, I want you to come see me. And, and it'll be, no one will know about it. I'm not going to put it on Facebook. Totally discreet, totally quiet, totally private. It'll break this addiction in you. Guaranteed it's going to work, okay? If you value your marriage in any way, uh, let's help you say no to instant gratification and yes to God. Okay, so here, here's the last thing. And this is, okay, this is where it's going to really sting. So just bear with me, okay? You guys told me you would, so just bear with me. Okay, so let's, let's just look. I just want to read this section again, just so you see. It's, this is Jesus speaking, okay? Verse 33. You have also heard that our ancestors were told, you must not break your vows, you must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven, because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by the earth, because the earth is his footstool. And do not say by Jerusalem, for Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple yes I will, or no I won't. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Okay. I'm not a legalistic guy. I'm just saying that when God calls you to a holiness, that means he's described what your life should be in Scripture, and it's our job to endeavor to live that out. Would you agree? Do you want to do that? 
Okay, this is going to sting. I love our country. I would rather not, I'd rather live here than any other place in the world. I want to preface my statements by saying that because this is going to hurt. A vow, okay, the New Living is not the only Bible. It's not the only viable Bible, okay? There are some Bibles that don't say vows. They say promise, oath, pledge, guarantee, or swear. Okay? These are all synonyms for the word vow. They're all the same thing, okay? And, and, and so I want to I talk about these things right here, okay? And, and it's obvious that Jesus is really pushing fidelity in marriage for sure. So as church, you know, we should hold marriage in high regard too. But it's not just fidelity in marriage that he's talking about, okay? It's, it's fidelity in you personally, and that's why he's talking about your heart. Like he wants to make you a faithful person, okay? A trustworthy person faithful person of character, okay? So, let's, let's think about this for a second. Um, we, we go and we have weddings in the church, right? And we, and we gather in the church and we get up before all the people and the beautiful bride comes walking down and they join hands and everything and what do they exchange? Vows. Vows with scripture in them. Vows that we are committing to the Lord and to each other to keep. To a God who says, don't do that. What are we doing? Does that make any sense at all? Does it make sense to make vows based on the book that's telling you not to? But this just is what we've always done. Does it make sense for a president to walk up and put his hand on the book and make and be sworn in and take the oath of office when the Bible and the author of it clearly says, don't do that. Well, if he doesn't swear on the Bible, then he's a Muslim and he won't defend the Constitution. Really? I understand our political heat that we're in right now. Jesus said, don't make an oath. Don't swear by anything. Don't make a vow. As all know, Colin Kaepernick, this football player, who kneels during the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm not taking sides on that one at all, because I'm a Bible guy. I don't, I don't care what Colin Kaepernick. I don't even. I, I just know he's got a really cool hairdo. But I want you to do something with me. The, Jesus Christ said, "Do not make a pledge." And so what we do, now listen, first, first, and, first and foremost, don't, when, when I'm about to tell you something, don't say, well, if you don't do the Pledge of Allegiance, you don't love America because. That you find it awkward that that same God that says that, that he wants that from you, and he says don't make any pledges, vows, oaths, or swear, that we put our hand on our heart that is supposed to be solely owned by Jesus Christ, and we pledge our allegiance to something other than him? What are we doing? Other than that's just what everyone's always done. And so to not do it is disrespectful. When all the while, the God of the Bible says, don't do that. Where's your allegiance? I'm not making fans here today. I get it. But I didn't write this. 
He said, I say, don't even make a vow. Don't even make a vow. And we're making vows, and we're swearing in, and we're making pledges, and we're taking oaths of office based on this, and this book tells us not to do that. You just got to discern this yourself, and you got to figure out what you're going to do with the clear and concise words of Jesus Christ the Lord. I know what I've done. I know that for me and my wife, when they do the Pledge of Allegiance, I do stand. And I respect and honor our country, and I love it. But no chance I will ever put my hand on my heart and swear the allegiance of my heart to anyone or anything, including that woman, to anyone other than Jesus. Ever. <clears throat> he said, be holy, guys. Different. Set apart. Like him. He also says, like, don't, don't swear on this and don't swear on that. You know, people say it all the time. Oh, I swear to God. I swear on, I swear on my head. I swear on this. And I swear, people were doing it back then too. They swear on, uh, by, to God. They swore on the temple. They swore on Jerusalem. They swore on all this kind of stuff. And you know what he's saying? He's going, yeah, you don't own anything. What are you putting up for collateral, punk? You can't put that up. That's not yours. That, that, Jerusalem's mine. Earth is mine. Heaven is mine. You, you can't even swear on your own head. You know why? Because your head is mine. Everything you've ever gotten, you've received. And so the Bible would say, if you've received all that you have, why would you boast as if you've not received it? Colossians 1.16 says that everything was created by him and for him. You can't put something up for collateral, if you will. All right, you can take my word on it because I'm putting this up as collateral. Really, you're going to put up... You're going to put up heaven? You don't own heaven. I own heaven. You can't put that. That's mine. You can't put that up. And then last but not least, he says, so forget oaths and, you know, in my house, my wife won't even, she will not even say I promise. You know why? Because she keeps her promises as good as the rest of us. We break them sometimes, don't we? We don't want to. I don't want to lie to anybody. I love you. I mean, you're my friends. You're my family. I love you. But I can't always keep my word. Things happen, right? So, so don't make a promise because you're not going to keep it. And that's what God, like, don't make a vow or a pledge or swear by because you can't keep it. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. And anything beyond that, think of all the things that we do about our pledges and our oaths and our swearing in and our vows. Jesus said when we do that, that's from the evil one. Christian weddings. Christian swearing in. Christian, I pledge allegiance under God. Like, anything more, when you do that, it's of the devil. Isn't that what it says? Did I read it wrong? Anything beyond that, simple yes or no. So, so doesn't that just scream fidelity? Doesn't it just scream loyalty? Doesn't he, isn't God saying, listen, when you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you say, I do, I'm married to you, I love you, that means you keep your word. If you say, I'm going to show up at your house to help you do something, you keep your word. If you say, I'm going to be at the church to do something, you keep your word. Just let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Anything beyond that is of the evil one. Crazy. <clears throat> See, it's hard to, to, to bring God into the little nooks and crannies of the things that we so commonly do. We're just doing this stuff all the time, and it just seems so, you know, it's the tradition. This is just what we've done. It's what Grandma did. It's what Grandpa did. It's what, it's what we've been doing. So we just do it, because that's what we've always done before. I think it's just time that we rethink some of our Christian practices by letting God's word shape what we do, not tradition or custom or culture. 
So Jesus quotes and reaffirms the laws of God. In this case, he's talking about adultery, please. Divorce and vows. All three still valid. All three still in effect today. But hopefully now we understand the heart behind them and the goal that God had in his mind when he gave them to us, which is our holiness. That's what he's going after. He's going after you. Give yourself completely to God, the scriptures say. Don't be satisfied with I've given you a lot. Give, he says, give it all. Give it all. We need to be people of integrity, people of character, a people who can be trusted, a people who keep their word, and most importantly, a people who put their witness for Jesus above any in-the-moment desire of our flesh. Grace abounds, and we're so happy about our grace, right? Grace, 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 oh, the grace of God, and that's awesome. We thank you, Lord, for it. Because we didn't deserve salvation. We didn't seek salvation. We didn't want salvation, but grace gave us salvation. But grace doesn't waive God's laws or his desire for you to be holy even as he is holy. And so let's, let's try to shrink the chasm between what is written and what is lived. What is written and what is done. Let's get our toes off the edge of the sin cliff, right? Let's back away from that cliff a little bit and let's let God's word shape our thoughts and actions. Let's, let's lay down tradition and let's lay hold of truth. And let's start living that way. Amen?